I have been the lead investigator of the case for the past four or five years, I would say. And Meyer's evidence consists of photographs, films, metal, audio, and the prophecies. Now let's start with the photographs. I want to talk about this 1975 photo, this photo from 1981, and then this is a frame grab from a film that Meyer took in 1975 as well. Now as you can see there's something very similar about the tree that appears in these three different uh, shots. They each contain the same bite mark out of the top right of the tree. They have the same angle on the right side of the tree. The film footage is too poor in quality to see any more details, but in the other two photos, the 1975 photo and the 1981 photo, they share the same lower right branch, the same bumps on the trunk of the tree, and the same dangling lower left branch. So maybe the extraterrestrials just like this tree. What, you know, what's the harm in that? This is the location of the 1975 photo. As you can see, there is no tree. No one seems to remember where the film was taken, but it was not taken in either Wetzikon or in Pinwell. And there's over four kilometers between Pinwell and Wetzikon. This panoramic photo composite was actually provided by Figu. What the skeptic failed to show or acknowledge is that Figu also provided this panoramic view overlaid with one of Meyer's many photos of the UFO circling the full-size tree. As you can see, the photo fits in perfectly, validating that both the tree and the UFO were indeed on that very piece of land. It's said that the tree was eliminated later by Semyaze. Strangely enough, the farmer who owns the land continues to this day to mow the grass around the very spot where the tree once existed. So all of the evidence suggests that this same model tree was used in the different photographs and films because the trees all share the same physical characteristics. The tree is the same size and shape even after six years. The photos and films were each taken in different cities. There's no evidence that a real live tree ever existed in any of these locations. And the official explanation from Meyer and his followers is that the extraterrestrials erased people's memories about the tree, but they left the photographs and the films alone. Actually, Meyer took photos of UFOs next to different kinds of trees, including these barren branch trees, four of them in this photograph. He took photos of the UFOs above trees and even in forests. Professional photographer, model maker, and miniature tree cultivator Jeff Ritzman tried to duplicate Meyer's UFO tree photos and couldn't. And on top of that, six professors of forestry looked at Meyer's photos and looked at the trees and each one determined that the trees are full-sized mature trees and not models. I don't keep photos of models in my collection. Yes. And I don't keep fakes in my collection. So you know, we faked those and we faked them with models and neither one was of interest to me after Jim pointed out the difference. The model photos have sharper images because light travels less distance, less dispersal. The bottoms of the models are usually darker than the bottoms of the spacecraft because they're smaller and they don't pick up as much light reflection. Billy Meyer has released a handful of 8mm films of his spacecrafts in the 1970s. It's important to understand that Meyer's films have never been transferred to videotape properly. One of the films, Meyer's says, shows that the object cannot be a model because it goes behind a hill in the distance. So does this film prove that the object is large and in the distance because it goes behind the hill? No, it doesn't. The film is just simply too poor in quality to be able to determine this. There is a jump where the, the object appears to be in two places at the same time. Meyer and his followers have stated that this is due to the ability of the object to travel so fast that it literally could appear in two places on one frame of film. The double image was most likely caused by stopping the camera, then changing the object's position, and then turning the camera back on. Meyer and his followers have spent a considerable amount of time discussing the propulsion capabilities of this craft and theorizing on all the properties that it has because the object appeared in two places 
on the same video frame. But all of this time and energy was wasted because I simply did not understand how film is transferred to videotape. Four frames of film need to become five frames of video. This is done by duplicating some film frames onto two different video fields of the same video frame. This causes some video frames to actually contain two different film frames. This is called interlacing. Using the very same film the skeptic refers to, we can see that the UFO does indeed partially go behind the hill. Since the hill is some distance from the camera, perhaps a quarter mile, it's impossible that the UFO is a small model. And notice that there's a continuous movement to the UFO as it flies back to the starting point in the center of the screen, becoming larger as it does. The film experts from Japan's Nippon TV not only looked at and videotaped the film, they looked at the film itself and indeed found the jump is made in only one frame. No cuts, no stops, and no models. In the original highly detailed and thorough investigation report, it was absolutely determined by professional film experts from Nippon TV that the UFO appears in two places at once in only one frame of film. This is a photo of the actual segment of film that they examined. So the transfer rate of film to video is irrelevant to the discussion. I personally showed Meyer's UFO photos and films to the owners of the company that won the Academy Award for Special Effects. When I asked them if these were models, these photos and films, they said, no, we know models and those aren't models. I asked, can you duplicate Meyer's films? And they said, if we could, we'd have to go to CGI. And I reminded them that in 1976 and 78, there was no Photoshop, no CGI, and no home computers. Billy Meyer also has metal samples that he claimed demonstrate signs of extraterrestrial manufacturing. This is that metal. The metal sample contained nearly every element in the periodic table, Vogel stated. Each pure element was bonded to each of the others, yet somehow retained its own identity. At 500x magnification, thulium was revealed. At 1600x, there are structures within structures and at 2500x magnification, the sample was metal, but at the same time, it is crystal. Now this is an image of a diatom. It's a type of phytoplankton at 5000x magnification. Even using magnification far greater than what Marcel Vogel used when he did his examination, it is still impossible to view the elemental or atomic structure of an object using a scanning electron microscope. The resolution of the scanning electron microscope is simply not high enough to image down to that level. In fact, increasing the magnification of any object using any form of microscope will not tell you what the object is made of. The only way to determine the composition of an object is to use a process such as gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Meyer and his followers point to Marshall Vogel's analysis as another form of proof that Meyer has been in contact with the extraterrestrials. 